Welcome everybody to a third uh, episode of Sake Drinker of Friends. We are very lucky today. We have a master with us, uh, Sir Lucero. We have Scott Barber, who you most likely saw on the show before. And he's had six episodes so far. Very successful uh, for all of us in the industry. Uh, so let's do what we're here for. Uh, we're going to talk about sake. Uh, we're going to try a couple different styles. And of course, we always need a little bite. Uh, I love the pairing factor to it. Yeah. And uh, I thought it'd be, it'd be fun to bring a little house cure, cure prosciutto. Uh, an Italian plum of the, the neighbors. Uh, don't tell him I, I took out of the street. <laughs> he, he takes a lot of care of him. Uh, and then we'll, we'll just try stuff. We'll answer some questions and uh, enjoy it. That's what sake is yeah. meant for, I think, as any other alcoholic and non-alcoholic beverage. It's good friends, good talks. Yeah. And uh, without further ado, we'll start with Kinja Shizuku. Uh, unless you guys want to mention anything. Let's get to it. And Absolutely. then this will make us talk a little longer, yeah. right? <laughs> so uh, Takasago is the brewery. Kinja Shizuku is the style. Shizuku is one method of uh, making sake. So we've talked about in previous episodes about the polishing of the sake, the rice, the water, how all this affects the style. Well, one of the, the most regarded methods is the shizuku, which literally translates to gravity flow or drip method. So you grab the, the mash, the sake de marome, you hang it on a roof, and it'll just drip by itself, no force. So you have a very delicate, just ultimately seductive, simple style of sake. Now, um, Takasago Brewery has taken it to the next level, and every year, first of all, they're located in Hokkaido, which is northern Japan, uh, cold, a lot of snow. They decided to build an igloo and drip the do the drip method, the Shizuku, inside the igloo that they build every year. So it captures all the, the temperature controlled, it's out there, uh, the yeast, everything. It's the ultimate style of making sake. This is some you yeah. have both worked before in the laundry, which is yeah. uh, very successful in pairings. Yeah. Yeah. Right. We, we used to work with this at the French Laundry. We used to actually pair it with caviar. That's how delicate and elegant mm -hmm. we think that this particular sake is. And to know that is actually, you know, it kind of, you collect the drippings of, uh, of the, what is it called, the maromi, the mash? The maromi, the mash. The maromi, the, the mash, you know, which is what, you know, the, the rice is essentially. Uh, under these cold conditions, like when a liquid is cold, the, the viscosity of that liquid begins to, to, to become greater. When it's warmer, it becomes much more loose and it runs much faster. So it must take a, a tremendous amount of time for Absolutely. the sake to be collected or this juice, this, these droplets, these divine droplets to be, exactly. to be I guess, uh, collected. Absolutely. Will. And not only, Absolutely. sometimes you can base the sake, or most times, into the price correlating to the method, right? So in this style, it's a daiginjo, Junmai daiginjo which might take up to three days to polish the rice itself. Plus, you have about 24 to 48 hours to let the, the drip. And then granted, you're not using the whole, uh, whatever you can extract out of the, the sake, right? All the juice. You're just letting the drops. Exactly, they, right. they are not supposed to use any pressure. There's no so pressing, that's, that's incredible. Yeah, so it, it's, yeah. it's like the smallest niche that can get out of this yeah. high quality product. We have, a, we have a term for that, for one of the most uh, amazing, actually oldest dessert wines in the world, and that's called Essentia. And uh, we, we take these raisinated grapes, um, uh, mostly from ferments from the area of Hungary, and, and you actually just let them with the free run pressure and the weight from the grapes above it, kind of almost smash, and the weight of the grapes press themselves, and it's just a free run juice, and the Essentia is just this amazing nectar, if you will. So we're talking about just the most elegant of elegant of uh, of uh, styles, sakes. absolutely. Like purity and finesse and elegance and um, can I taste it? Please, Why? without further ado, yeah, definitely. Like this is what we're here for. So, cheers. Most gorgeous. Beautiful. Now it's very, very delicate on the nose. You know, sometimes I come across some sakes that have a little more power, a little more richness mm -hmm. to them, a little more, I guess, um, more of an earthy masculinity to them. Sometimes some mushroom or something like that. Absolutely. But this one is like just jump out. This one is it's tropical melon blossoms. Very delicate. This is like yeah. I uh, could say feminine, but you know feminine. It's I'll, like a I'll young geisha. Back. No, okay, anyway. In my understanding, that sake or this wine is super delicate, super complex. The sake, isn't it the the goal for complexity and the price escalating in sake depending on the subtlety? Of the, of the sake. In, in a way it is. Uh, however, there's another Shizuku method, the Seven Spearsmen, the Shishigunyari, which is the same method, uh, 
not in an ego way, but done with with a lot of love as well. And the ending result is like scotch, scotch drinkers, sake. Uh-huh. It's like tobacco, big, rich. Personally, one of my favorites. And it's it's exact same method. It's also a Junmai Daiginjo, just a different prefecture and the the style that the yeast, the natural yeast that collects in the area. They use a mm-hmm. more, I guess, deeper, more hearty, earthy grain of rice. The rain, that? if I'm not mistaken, is the same one. Okay. And uh, the same it, same grain, same rice. Okay. However, uh, the prefecture and the actual a lot of people argue there's no terroir in sake, but uh-huh. the actual pre- pre- prefecture, the water, the hard mineral right. water. The temperature, everything affects mm-hmm. a lot into that. Yeah. A, a prefecture, water. prefecture in Japan, is essentially like the region of where it's coming from. So you know, we're saying prefecture, like a state. Yeah, like a regionality, state or yeah. a region, mm-hmm. you know, uh, somewhere uh, like that. And I think we might have a question. Hmm. Yeah, I, I do have a question. I'm kind of a newbie when it comes to sake, so you have to forgive me. But temperature, uh-huh. cold, room temperature, hot, and so, and why? In, are there why are sometimes it's served hot and kind of so go over that? It, to better answer that question, there's a historical reason for it. Um, a few hundred years ago, there was the quality of sake that the, the actual people, other than the uh, the higher higher people, could drink. It's the lower quality. So, as any other beverage, when you heat it, you hide a lot of the imperfections. So you would grab this sake that was like the run end on the bottom heat it up and drink it and it has become palatable, right? Now, these days, that's become an option. You also do it with the cheaper, although that's not an answer. Somebody put a lot of love into making a beverage to call it cheap, right? However, uh, you heat it and you drink it faster, better. Now, there is some sakis, and we had Stuart Morris, who is bringing some sakis from Japan. He is a big fan of heating up sake. So when you grab some of his own sakis, honjos and whatnot, and try it cold and hot, it just acts completely different, both amazing, and it shows you that it's not only for cheaper styles. So that's the, 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 long, the long answer. Yeah, no, no, that's, yeah. that's the, you know, the answer sometimes you have to give context. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And so, Normally, yeah. sake is poor, it's serve about 55, 60 degrees, and unless it's like some meant to be. That's a great heated. question, thank you. Yeah, that is an amazing question. I guess, unfortunately, it's like any other beverage where there's, there's no simple answer. No, it's just trying. Um, Anthony that works with us, who's also sake certified, he, he, is, he goes once a week and heats up a sake that he, he just bought that week and tries it hot, cold, everything, and then he comes with a report. And then he says, I tried it with strawberries and this and that. So it's really fun to keep always evolving, right? It's, there's not like, like Chardonnay, you wouldn't do that. Chardonnay, you wouldn't go heat it at home <laughs> in a metal pan and see how it does. You just totally don't do it. <laughs> But with sake, it allows for that playfulness with it. So it sounds like, I mean, a given sake could be served either hot or cold, depending on the dish. The application. Exactly, Absolutely. Right? So I love I mean, that. It was really, yeah. yeah, you I, have that freedom. I do that uh, often with wine. Right? I'll serve them at different temperatures depending upon the application because it gives them a different texture. You know, when it's something really cold, a lot of times it'd be very, very kind of, uh, how do you say, angular and more precise. And then when it gets, as it warms up, the concentration of fruit begins to show a little more. Give them a little more rounder on the palate, so yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Noir reds, Beaujolais, things like that. Would, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Temperature very sensitive. Yeah, Pinot is super sensitive for temperature. Sweet. Absolutely. Yeah. Fifty. Uh, one more thing I wanted to touch, since you touched on prefectures. Uh, one way for everybody that's that's trying to learn it and kind of wrap their head around the sake. I see Japan as Italy, right? In a similar temperature fashion. So the northern it's it's colder. The southern is warmer heavier, richer mineral water. Obviously, the wines from, from the south of Italy are a little richer, rounder, yes. like Caliopo and all those things. Perhaps. And the north are cleaner and sharper. So if you if you look at Japan, it's very similar and easy to look at it that way and get familiar with it. And Yeah, I love that. Yeah, it would probably I never actually really thought about it like that, but yeah, I mean, I've heard, you know, about, you know, the snow that takes place in northern Japan and, you know, knowing that, you know, that there's different types of water. I know that water is such a, an important factor in sake mm-hmm. making, you know, because, you know, I don't know if you've ever done water tastings, but sometimes like when, you know, like we would get together and really truly geek out, we would get together like six or eight bottles of water and we would do water tastings. And you'd actually feel the different oh, yeah. types of water on your palate and they have a definite different texture to them. You know, Evian's full and round and, you know, mm-hmm. really kind of lush and kind of heavy. General Steiner's really yeah, hard. And, yeah. You know, and some, some, some are really kind of sharp and precise and they leave your palate feeling very, very light and clean and wet, you know, Aquafina, mm-hmm. if you will. Yeah. 
Um, the Sani is a little bit more heavy. It's got some mineral kind of flavor profiles on the finish, and you know, so it's like the water is such a huge part of of of, of I guess the, the quality of the, the quality of the sake that they really kind of regard their water sources as being sacred, and so. Um, Absolutely. There's actually a few uh, breweries in uh, in Japan that are exporting, importing water from other regions. Oh, really? Yeah. They, they'll get a, a truckload and just bring it to another yeah. place, which is kind of defeats the purpose in a way because you want to think about, let's say, a, uh, a brewery in Hiroshima being uh, different than a one in Akita, but at this point, they, you can, know, they I can mean, transfer water. I mean, we import French oak for, for Chardonnay, our Chardonnays, you know, and, you know, our, our oak barrels and and I understand, and you know, sometimes you know we export you know our American oak to to Amarone so they can you know make some of theirs, and you know that happens. Um, you know, people you know in Italy and Tuscany are importing Hungarian oak and Slovenian oak, and you know, so 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 yeah. I mean, I can I'll, I'll, I'll grant a little leeway for water. It's arguable, yeah. yeah. It's okay. Are there regional it's characteristics? Yes, yeah, usually the, the north, north as the as this. I mean, obviously you have factors like the the method and the the rice and all these things in the polishing. But normally, the north sakes, if you didn't know anything about sake and you're looking at a list when you get to a place, if you see a northern style sake from Akita, Hokkaido, Niigata, you can pretty much assume 90% is going to be a cleaner style, right? And then when you start looking at Shizuoka, at uh, Hiroshima, a little north, southern places, uh, Kobe, all those places, you can expect a little richer, bigger round mouth. Yeah. A little more electric, a little more nervy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a little more masculine, if you will. Look at it okay. as masculine and feminine on the top. Got it. Cool. So it's yeah. I'd say we try with Electric the plum memory. just for fun and uh, right. see how it reacts. All right. So plum, on the skin, we're going to have some acid, and, and then on the flesh, we're going to have some sugar coming in, and that's going to kind of do – that's probably going to counterbalance the that's acid good. and the sugar that's naturally – that's a gorgeous yeah, plum. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Wow. I'm gonna be very happy. Come here, guys. Get, yeah. get, get a piece of plum. Get a piece of plum. This looks amazing. You guys have to have some. Not my piece, but you guys. Yeah. Damn, oh, oh, make sure you grab some sake too. Mm. Oh, he was part. Oh, man, oh you got it. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Wow. It's good to live in California. I mm -hmm. promise. <laughs> man, that's good. Where do you live? How far away is that? No, I'll, I'll show you after the show. Let me ask you this question here. Uh, the importance of glassware for something. Mm -hmm. so is it like as important as wine, for instance? It is in a way. However, if you were to put any sake into a burgundy or a Bordeaux glass, like a nice size with it or whatnot, you'll get the full exposure and aroma. It's, it's done like that for a reason. Now, historically, sake has been sent, uh, served in chocos, which is a small little clay, if you will, or a ceramic container. And it's... It has rings in the middle to measure the, uh, the quality of it, in a way, with the light. But that doesn't allow you, as us, we love to smell a beverage and whatnot. It doesn't give you the full aroma. So it's, it's great for drinking, especially hot sake, or cheers, or whatnot, and just shoot it. But to get the, the full expression, wine glass, it's, it's your best. Like right. a particular shot. Exactly. Glass. Yeah. 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 I know this one. Exactly. <laughs> I do notice that the alcohol is noticeable. You know, the alcohols mm -hmm. are higher in sake, and you do get a little blast of that in the burgundy glass. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how does that affect the, the flavors and the other aspects of the sake? So that, that elevated alcohol, how do they manage that? Well, first of all, we're trying it about, what, 62 degrees? 60, it's pretty warm in here. So I would ner normally serve at the restaurant around 55. So that's going to hide some of the alcohol naturally. Mm -hmm. And yeah. just just play with the the pairings. You want richer, uh, fattier fish yeah. and whatnot. Yeah, I'm noticing that. I, I know the sake before that. I, you know, I've tasted it several times, but it, it's a little bit richer and fuller and rounder, especially in this glass. Absolutely. And you know, the the glassware kind of sometimes manipulates the the beverage very similar to wine and temperature. Mm -hmm. So you know, the temperature has something to play into it. You know, the the glassware and how much surface area is being uh, all those aromatics that are kind of volatilizing. And you're able to smell those, you know, that has to do with, you know, this kind of glass. Sometimes you have your, you know, your tequilas you take a shot from, you know, and they just have the impact of that, 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 that power. And then you have your tequilas that really taste very delicate and a little bit more nuanced. And you sip those. And so, you know, the, the glassware has a huge impact and, you know, I'm sure the temperature does also. I mean, this is just a fantastic sake. It's one of my favorites. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just fun. Yeah, it has a story. It's always a treat to taste it. Mm -hmm. Thank you for bringing it. Oh, pleasure. I need to enjoy it.
So at Morimoto, do you do you serve it in the little? I forgot what you call them. The so right now I'm using it. And can called, you can you maybe order it in a in a regular? Glass? Absolutely. So it, depending on the sake, when I when friends come or whatnot, I'll pour it either either in a like a cordial, a wine glass, or when you order a flight, um, I have a really good uh, friend, a really good friend who I used to live with, who's an artist, and he makes he made us these barrel staves, and we got this glass we called Experience Glass. It has a very cool uh, ending at the at the top, kind of goes uh, curved in a way, where it allows you to express the aroma. If you're pouring like two ounces, mm -hmm. you have plenty of room to get that the whole expression. Expression. So I do flights of uh, sake, chochu, tequila, anything in those, and it comes with the slate with the stave, so it's pretty easy. And now we're bringing it to all the restaurants all throughout the U.S. I experienced so that. I love it. You yeah. That to me. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's the easiest way, and you walk through the room, and people are like, wow. And the actual glasses are, are pretty cool. It's, it's thick. It's, it's a very nice size glass. It helps out perfectly. But wine glass anytime. And feel free when anybody go to a to a sushi place and they have a proper wine glass, go ahead and try with it. Try it side by mm -hmm. side with what the, whatever they serve it with and ask for it. Different so ones. Beautiful. Now, because <laughs> these are so handcrafted and there's a lot of variables like the the mold and the water and the rice mm -hmm. is there variation? Or is it consistent from year to year? It is very consistent, very, extremely consistent. I've had, I've been drinking this style of sake for four years now, and I've, I've, have always stayed true to form. They, they've managed their best they can to get the, the same conditions, hmm. in and out. Yeah, I mean, there's also nama sakes which are, are, are pasteurized, made seasonal. So those you got a little more variance. They're let's say this year was a little warmer, or not, and. You get like tomato watery characteristics yeah. on it. Is Namazaki the, the natural fermentation that from the airborne yeast? I forget. Uh, Namazaki, the only difference is it's not pasteurized. Oh, no, so those, they can those make are Yamahai's. Yamahai. Yamahai. Right. Yes. I, I that try and keep method. all the terms. Yeah. I mean, I had flashcards with all these things on it, and I remember some of it, some of it I don't. That's why we have true experts here. <laughs> yeah. Not really an expert. I just drink a lot of sake. <laughs> so, uh, no, there's, the there is a lot one. of. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> there is a lot of little uh, things like fune, it's another way of pressing. Yamaha, as you said, is the older method of uh, putting the lactic acid. Uh, there's Kimoto, which they use false ram, the actual marome, which gives it a uh, bigger depth. A little more, so, yeah. Yeah. So what I brought, these other shisaku, I brought right? regular Sorry. styles, Sorry. except for the Shizuku. Uh, this is probably one you can find widely all through the U.S. and whatever you are in the world. Uh, I know um, Whole Foods, in occasion, they'll have them. And it's uh, Wakatake Onikoroshi, the Demon Slayer. Oh, uh, yes. What is not uh, to like about the name, right? So, <laughs> I drink those often in different. There's different grades of Demon Slayer, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah there's the Junmai. There's the Negori even. This is the Junmai Ginjo, a little yeah, higher okay. polishing. It's from Shizuka, which will let us see the difference on the prefectural characteristics. So it's southern on the uh, eastern side of, of Japan. Let's say it's like, if you were to compare to the U.S., it's like the Florida of it on the okay. tip end. And it's it's a pretty fun masculine broad shoulder style. As you were saying earlier, you're used to more that style, the a little uh, stinkier in a way, more masculine. This is it. I'm okay with it. I had a question, please. You, you, you've mentioned uh, polishing yes. a couple of times, and I just didn't understand. The please, thing. somebody ask it. So the uh, the you get a grain of rice, the husk. So to make sake, to make premium sake, you polish away some of the impurities on it, right? So there's different classifications. Junmai or Honjoso is the lowest. You polish it up to 30%. Uh, Junmai Ginjo is 40%. And Junmai Dai Ginjo is 50 and more. Now there's no limit, and this is just a, the re required by law. So there is some sakas that are polished as far as 67% these days, which you only leave the shimpaku, which is the heart of the rice, and it be becomes really delicate and clean. You're taking away all the impurities. You can kind of see that, like when you say shimpaku, um, you've ever made risotto and it gets translucent and like the, the, the kind of the, almost the center nucleus, if you will, of, of the rice kernel, everything else gets translucent, but you can still see that kind of center. It's, it's really concentrated in just the carbohydrate and the water and the proteins and all the other, I wouldn't say impurities, but whatever went into the, the, to the rice kernel that feeds that nucleus is all are surrounding that shimpaku. Protein. Yeah, and it's like proteins aroma. and other things which give it more body and richness and depth. So when you kind of polish those little outside edges away from the, the, the shimpaku or this like nucleus of this little kernel of rice 
or carbohydrate inside the rice grain, um, you're getting rid of the impurities and you make a cleaner, more precise, uh, elegant sake from it. And sometimes that's better. And sometimes, you know, you want a more powerful, rich you know, sake that has more depth to go with your things like the uh, unagi or, I mean, I don't know, those other deeper dashi yeah, like broths and stuff and like whatnot. that. And it seems like the closer you get to that core, the more the gradations are in subtlety. And maybe that's why it's the most are, delicate and just yeah. pure and, mm-hmm. and feminine, mm-hmm. if you will. Mm-hmm. So it's just a matter of, of, of taste. Like I have friends that only drink daiginjus, just like you only you prefer chablí anytime. Some people prefer yeah. daiginjus <laughs> all the time, and they don't care spending three hundred bucks on a bottle of sake because it's the highest purest style. I myself and a lot of other people. I mean, I don't have a preference. It's like kits. You can't pick just one, right? Well, sometimes you can, but. Um, <laughs> You, I, I prefer the, the more expressive nutty chestnuts, mushroom kind of kind of style yeah. of sake, which yeah. is like least polishing. Uh, there, there might be something another element in effect, but yeah, you know, uh, uh, our friend Stuart Morris, who's the sake master, uh-huh. definitely like every time I taste like the majority of, of sake that he tastes with me are those deeper, richer kind of really style. He pushing loves that, yeah. pushing the envelope on this kind of depth and power um, that he can reach. And you know, for me, like when I, I'm being such a novice of sake. Regardless of whether or not I study it a lot, and I you know I don't drink it enough, you know I always like the finesse and the precision, you know, because I like Chablis, I like my lines a little more kind of uh, angular and and precise. Um, but you know I see that you know if you drink those styles for so long, you're ready to start kind of experiencing different depths and different power ranges and different textures exactly. and aromatics, and so it's it's kind of great to see here his sentiment echoed within you. Absolutely. And and you know just kind of. It's fun, and then and then obviously it comes like with wine. It comes to what you're eating with it, or is it just by itself? It, it's what's going on around you, right? It's a winter, is it summer? There's a lot of factors. So would those coarser styles be uh, more like with soba or something like that? Or Absolutely, like that? yeah. yeah. Okay. Soba, ramen, uh, uh-huh. even steaks. Some okay. of them can stand. Uh-huh. I mean, they they have enough yeah. pressure. Cool. So yeah, let's talk about this one real yeah. quick. The wakatake. I keep drinking it. It's delicious. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of notes you guys get on this one? Yeah, it's definitely uh, more of a almost like a buckwheat kind of a hardier mm-hmm. thing than say the other one that was more yeasty and that's an awesome perfume. Call buckwheat. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's just the soba that got me talking. Yeah, the ultimate that, umami yeah. is just rich mushroom broth, matsutake. Yeah, a little porcini. Definitely. definitely. What do you guys get yeah, on this? This is creamy oh, kind of creamy. Creamy. It's just good. Yeah, isn't it? <laughs> it's we'll easy take drinking. it. We'll take it. Yeah, yeah. it tastes really good. good. Yeah, it tastes pure. Nice. You Definitely. know, like I can yeah. really taste the quality. Uh huh. Yeah. There's there's a there's a rich creaminess to it. Like even though that you know it doesn't necessarily you know um, perhaps have the 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 lighter kind of tr- almost transparency mm-hmm. sometimes that the divine droplets has, mm-hmm. but it has it has a, a presence to it that's very very polished and very very refined. Absolutely. You know, Do you guys get a little like cordial sherry at the end as well? A little oh, touch? Like the pit. Like, yeah. Like, like, mm-hmm. the, the liqueur of the when pit. You get into but it. a very, very fine. Like, uh-huh. yeah. Wow. It's I very do. subtle. I love the texture too. It's a rolling around, you know, that oh. glassy feel in the mouth. It's mm-hmm. really, it's really cool. Nice. Pretty fun stuff. Nice. I was trying to put my finger on that. You just nailed it. I love yeah. it. I'd love it if we try with a little prosciutto. All right. And since you have the, no, the I don't like prosciutto. Style. Okay. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> I'll make an exception today. Let's see. Something yeah, I had to here. stick for Minoshi, right? <laughs> Actually, Man. there's a little heart of a nutri on this one. Um, the Curtis Morimoto. came and made it with our executive chef. Ooh, I remember when he did that. Like, mm-hmm. like, so we're talking about our friend Curtis DeFady, who uh, you know founded a nutri, you know, as a chef. And, you know, amazing, oh, amazing yeah. talent. Um, Still a great friend, one of my food mentors. So he went with uh, Chef Masahara Morimoto and, and, and yeah. kind of helped create this pursuit. Oh, yeah, yeah, it was, it was a yeah. teamwork and it's it's amazing. Yeah. Curse to you, my man. To you, my man. Yes. Yeah, That's I mean, right. I'm going to actually unroll some of this. It's, it's beautiful. Oh. oh my gosh, it's gorgeous. Yeah, that is pretty Yeah, it's outstanding. This is incredible, oh, isn't it? It just, it just amplifies and extends. Brilliant. Yeah. Oh, nice. Good. It amplifies and extends that. Umami mm-hmm. savory. It just, you know, as you ro- unroll it, that's the way that it's kind of like a linebacker running at you, and it just grabs you and keeps running with you. <laughs> Man, right? <laughs> There's no stopping. How about like one of those big rollerblader girls instead of a linebacker? <laughs> like, there you go. Hey, pick your pick your runner there. 
That might have been like 10, 15 years ago. But. Yeah. <laughs> Still goes on, I guess. So a couple of those were probably there. They were like 65. Well, I think oh, sake, no. you know, <laughs> one of the things about beverages that's really always fascinated me and how it works with food is textures mm-hmm. and how textures interact. And a lot of people, when they write reviews about mm-hmm. wine or whatever, they talk about descriptors and flavors and stuff. But it, you don't think about the body of it, how it works together. And these are so well matched that it's just seamless, that mouthfeel and the texture of it all. Mm-hmm. I have a big, uh, how do you say, um, confession to make. Um, I feel like uh, in the wine world, when everybody talks about how acid really, really drives a wine to be really, really great with food, I feel like lower acid, rounder kind of blanketing styles of beverages help the food kind of ha- help soften the blow of anything that might be kind of out of balance with within the dish. Um, so... You know, a lot of people say, okay, yeah, it makes your palate salivate, you know, your mouth waters, so on and so forth, and I'm talking about wine right now. Well, sake naturally has a lower amount of, of acid in it because it comes from rice. It doesn't have, you know, the, the acidic outside um, uh, skin that the grape does. You know, everybody says, you know, that acid pushes the palate, pushes the palate, makes you want another bite of food. Yeah, well, it makes your mouth water because your palate is adjusting to what you're, what you've read, whatever you ate. Now, something like sake, which can be creamy, round, rich, and lush, is almost like pleasure on top of pleasure. So think about like something like, uh, um, I don't know, creamy caramel on top of like salty peanuts. You know, there's no acid there, right? It's just deep and rich and lush and flowing. So sake, I think, have amazing, amazing abilities to pair with food because a lot of times the acid issue doesn't come into play. And, you know, when acid is a big issue in your beverage, a lot of times it has to be done with the right dish in order for the dish to be able to stand up to the amount of acids you're adding. Kind of like if you're asking, if, you know, squeezing a piece of lemon on top of your food, the dish has to be right before you can do that. Sometimes the wine comes in and kind of takes away from the dish's experience because of the acid. Mm-hmm. And so I, I take a different approach to acid with wine than most people do in terms of talking about whether it's a positive or negative thing. Not that it's a positive or negative thing; it just has a different application. Absolutely, no, that's that's, that's enlightening. It's, it's kind of enlightening. wild to think of it that way. I go against pretty much everybody else in the rest of the wine world when I say that, but whatever. Well, when you think <laughs> about pairing okay, strategies, you can go with it and run with the current, or you I would can have drank across it. it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> when you're when you're doing a pairing, you can either do a concurrent pairing, or you can do a, you know cut across it, and they both work. Um, you know, sweet yeah. and salty. Is an angular, you know, nine degree perpendicular pairing versus other one. You know, you take the texture of say salmon and match it with Pinot Noir, and those are complementary. And so right. what you're saying is that the sake tends to make it more of a complementary, yeah. flowing pairing. Which yes, I which think instead of a contrasting pairing. Right? I think in order to make that work, you have to have a balanced dish as well. Mm. When you're doing the contrast, you may have a I love a, that. a dish that needs a little acid, and so the wine provides that brings it to the table. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Whereas, you know, maybe Japanese food Those is more pairings. complete on its own, and therefore it'll it's work with complement. a beverage that's also complete on its own that doesn't need yeah. correction. Mm-hmm. A classic example of what Scott's trying to say right now is, okay, you take an oyster and you shuck it. You put nothing on it. What do you need? You need some acid, something that's kind of bright and lean and sharp. So what do you drink? You drink? Well, if you don't have enough money for Chablis, you drink Muscadet, which is delicious. And I like, like Muscadet, but if you can drink Chablis, you drink Chablis, right? It's sharp, it's lean, it's crisp, and it kind of lifts up the oyster and cleans things out versus having something that's going to kind of, you know, you have umami and salt with your oyster. You need something that's kind of bright, lemony, and acidic to kind of clean all of those flavor profiles up. Acid kind of mitigates salt, and so therefore, you know, that pairing works very well. It's kind of contrasting, complementary. Or if the, the, or the oyster is prepared in a way that it's balanced on its own, right. something like this daiginjo mm-hmm. would be fantastic to match the texture of the oyster. Clean and sashimi the oyster. Or, yeah. And that, that works in its own way. So We're going down the street to Two more ways to do the same thing. Exactly. <laughs> do it. Yeah. 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 In about an hour. Yeah. So, sorry. Oh, I was just, while we were kind of talking here, and you kind of answered the question, but um, I noticed that I have trouble pairing wines with very salty foods. And I noticed that the prosciutto and the sake just so work. Huh? And then you were just kind of talking about the, the, the salty oysters, you know, kind of pair with that. Uh-huh. So I just I was just kind of curious what you guys thought about, you know, pairing sake's wines with, you know, particularly yeah. salty foods. Well, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Well, I, so salt to me does one major thing when it talks about like the chemical composition of your tongue. 
and it suppresses bitterness. And bitterness is probably the biggest factor that we taste as human beings, uh, more so than anything. We have a major aversion to bitterness, right? So, and that probably developed over the thousands and thousands of years that we were walking this earth, eating things as foragers and scavengers and hunters, and some of the things that were bitter kind of poisoned us. And so, you know, when you think of that term super taster, you know, most of them are women, and they end up generally having a, a much stronger aversion to bitterness than perhaps we do as men. Mm -hmm. And that that's okay. Um, uh, but what what kind of counterbalances uh, bitterness? Well, one is salt, and then the other is acid, and even again is sugar. So if you think about, you know, you take a really bitter green salad, like with like strong, super bitter greens, and what happens to go into your dressing is one fat, olive oil, whatever, you know, it could be like you know bacon fat. And you're adding what vinegar, salt, like you know, like you know, talking about sherry vinegar or whatever else. You're adding acid or lemon juice. Even the most basic terms, you're adding olive oil, lemon juice, and salt, right? Okay, so you're making a dressing to soften the bitter characteristic of the food. So what salt does when in high concentrations of food, it suppresses any bitterness that you have in a wine. So if you're going to have a very, very tannic wine that's really, really kind of grippy and astringent, those are kind of slightly related to bitterness. So the salt will come in and suppress the bitterness and make your wine be very, very soft and, fl and flowing and very, very kind of, kind mm -hmm. of more smooth and, and polished. Mm -hmm. um, and so... You know, the saltiness there is going to accentuate perhaps any fruit component in the wine and make it seem riper and a little bit more fleshy and opulent than it actually is. That's the chemistry behind the classic and I, um, Napa pairing of the slab and a cap. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, you have, a young, <laughs> you have a young tannic wine, you know, grilled steak with tannins, with fat, a ton and of salt, salt and yeah. delicious. Yeah. Perfect. The fruit yeah, explodes, perfect. the tannins yeah. disappear. And it's I apologize. I'm not magic. real good yeah. at giving a short answer. I apologize for <laughs> Which is perfect. That's why you're there. It's going back real quick. It's like prosciutto back in Italy with Lambrusco. And just got the, the bitter, yeah, uh, yeah. quality. Yeah. Yeah. Bam. Yeah. That does it. Yeah. yeah. Love it. I have no idea. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, on. I was just going to say the, uh, I mean, it, it's surprising to taste prosciutto with something so subtle, yet have it, I don't know, like pair so well. Like the softness of the sake is impressive, whereas often I eat. I don't know. I'm very of Italian rich rich and flavor and I like I, when I have prosciutto I might have something you know a little barbaresco or well, something the, like, and, like and like tasting it like on the yeah. opposite end of yeah. the spectrum is mm -hmm. it's it's impressive. I mean yeah. you you think about what what I'm doing to my palate sometimes and maybe I should try the opposite. <laughs> and that's what that makes me think. Awesome. <laughs> that, it's just that, fun. It's just you know, like you have a barbaresco, you want the boldest, the craziest, Absolutely. but it, to to match that mm -hmm. instead of like counteracting it, there, there you know, and that reasons. like I feel like that sake almost counteracted it, yet the flavor was here instead of like two points over here. Mm -hmm. there, there are lots of ways to solve the problem, and you see, yeah, how exactly. Like you think it's different a chef. cultures have completed these things, you know, over the centuries. Over, and yeah, that's really wow. what you're. You're doing, but then it's cool that we have this cross-cultural thing, so we can throw combinations that never grew up together. Yeah, yeah, that works. They, you know? They've never seen yeah, each other. It's exactly. Like, hey, meet, yeah, Italy meets fine. Japan. Oh, we're How friendly. Work? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it works so well together. They haven't seen each other since 1945. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on to it. <laughs> <laughs> wow, you went there. He went there. That was a Demon Slayer. <laughs> the Demon Slayer. Where was, that, where was that from again? What prefecture? Shizuoka, which is southern on the east side. Okay, and that was from no. the area, or what was it called? Hir uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima? Nagasaki, yeah. So there Quite. you go. Oh, this cool. one is close, yeah. actually. That was the reference that you're coming across, weren't you? No, no. I wish I was that clever, but All right, no, no. Didn't, didn't get it there. No. We'll leave the Germans on. I'll stop connecting dots. Oh, yeah. Yeah. where's the reasoning? Yeah. Um, uh, here, uh, pretty fun sake. This is totally out of the box, very unorthodox, small quantities made. This is not your everyday stuff. However, I do want to say, I, I met the owner, the current owner is like nine generations, and he's really proud that his great, great, great grandfather, he says, invented Kung Fu. So this is King, oh, wow. Kiko Mazamune, and that's like their big flag. Nice, very modest people, but he's really proud of that. And they like to tell the story. That's a modest statement. I invented karate. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I, so, invent, I invented walking way back when. <laughs> it was my great, great. Is he calling everyone grasshopper? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. 
So I just I think it's pretty funny, whether, whether it's true or not. Uh, Kiko Masamune, Taru Sake. Taru so it means cedar or oak in a way, in a loose term. Yeah, so this sake true. was made into a Junmai Shu, a regular style, and then aged in cedar for a very small time. So hence no color, still clear. But I can't wait till you guys try it. I, I've had nada. a ton of sake once in my life before, so I've like, never yeah, had one. You. But this was on the master. Yeah, I had a question. question. Yeah, really? I was like, oh, sake, oh, you know, like you can pull it out of somewhere. <laughs> Not made out of taro. Yeah. Thank you. Cheers. Appreciate it. Oh, wow. gentlemen, come up and try wow. some. Yes, please. Yeah, that's crazy. Whoa. I'm excited for Asian yeah. cedar. Like, <laughs> I don't even comprehend that. Without Honestly. a doubt, no, this, this is immediately outside of just it. cedar, this smells like tobacco, doesn't it? Yes. It has that kind of really nice Colorado, like, tan, not Maduro, because it's a little bit darker, but the, but the, but yeah. the, like, um, slightly the good, the good wrapper, lightly yeah. tan, like, yeah, Connecticut Sun-grown. shade wrapper. Yeah. It's, it's just something else. And and, and oh, it smells like the cedar strips that are inside the cigar. And my, my mm-hmm. cigar. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, that's what it smells like. That's what it smells like. I want to smoke a cigar so bad. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, this yeah. is just like, good like, like you know, it was sun, a great day. Yeah. We succeeded at everything. Yeah. Let's have a sip of this. We're two hours from sunset. The Napa River is yep. right there. <laughs> yep. Southern Some Crossing. Napa, yeah. <laughs> yeah, where's our closest wine shop? No, there's a crazy one. You're, usually you pair like a scotch or a port or something. Mm-hmm. Oh, I got the thing for you. Sake. Blow you mind. never expect it. Yeah, exactly. Now, note the extreme refreshing, clean tasting at the end that is just cleansing. And the acid, I mean, if you will, as much acid as you can find in sake, it's there. It's like tingly. Mm. Curtis the Fady. Yeah. Fantastic. It really is. Mm, isn't it? It's just off the beaten path and it's just it's fun. And you don't have to break the piggy bank. This is on the list for forty something bucks, forty two dollars. Nice. Share it with your friends and you know you know what I, I find which is really interesting about the sake is that you know the other two sakes have this really kind of crazy polish to them, like this really beautiful, refined elegance and it's round and it's very smooth and, and contoured, you know, the palate texture and feel. This one with this with the cedar, you know, when you smell cedar, right? Like if you have like cedar horn shoes or whatever, it's a very very precise kind of like characteristic to it. It almost feels like aromatically like you just have a reference point that when you're tasting this wine, you can kind of see the sake jump off. It's not as round and angular. There's like this line going right through it that you can reference versus having just nothing but a kind of a softer round creamy texture to it. And it's just it's like not agree. something like I've ever really remember assessing before in my life. You guys better eat this. Appreciate that. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. You mentioned you know the price on the list. Now, what's the correlation between increasing price in sake? Because a lot of people will sit and look at a sake list and see some sakes are five hundred dollars and some are fifty. Yeah. You know, and you know we can kind of explain that sometimes in line with complexity or extraction or whatever. But you know, what do you get between the high end sake? What What you get, as I was mentioning earlier, it's it's the hand that goes in into the, the production of any beverage in the world, most likely honest honest uh, production will relate to, to the craftsmanship and the time you put into it and the, the labor. So in sake, to put it in, in clean pers- uh, perspective, it's a Junmai to a Junmai Daiginjo. You, you'll rarely see a Junmai for more than $80, $100. Rarely. I don't have one over 60 in the list. Daiginjo, you can go up to $350, $500. And it's all because it's either a super small production, but the, the actual method to make the daiginjo, like hence the chisuku, you drip it, you lose a lot of, of, of juice in there, and then you polish. And this polishing can, as I said, take up to three days on the mm-hmm. machine to keep polishing the rice. So it's direct. And at Junmai, it takes you two hours to polish it and then make the, the product and, yeah. and sell it. So they're not going to go through the entire process of making a Junmai daiginjo and the cost involved with it if they're not using the highest quality rice from the highest quality location, using the best practices, and mm-hmm. therefore the price just incrementally just... Absolutely. Just and it's just passing it on. Mm-hmm. I mean, okay. it depends. There is very few um, examples in my in this few years that I've, I've really worked close with sake that I've seen a brewery just charge more because, because they wanted to, because they decreased the production and purpose, and they were only bringing five cases to the U.S., as like with wine happens a little more often, not to say anything, but somebody might say, hey, 
I make this and I close my eyes while I blend it and I charge 500 bucks, right? In, in a way. I don't know or, what you're talking about. No, I me mean neither. I, mean, <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about. I'm sorry, it doesn't happen here in Napa Valley. <laughs> no, but I, it's still, as I tell my staff, there's no cheap sake, no spend, or wine or any beverage in the world. There's a lot of love that goes into it regardless, whether it's a clearly biz, business venture or your family for centuries. Yeah. It is something made with love. Are there regions that are acclaimed in the same way like Porto or Napa Valley or... Barolo might be. Yeah. Funny enough, Nara, which the Tarusak is from, which makes no, no a clear remark in there, it's, it's known as some of the cleanest water, and a lot of people search for the cleanest uh, water there is. Yeah. And it tends to drive yes. it a little more. However, there is not one region in, in Japan. I mean, a lot of people, as I said, it depends on your, on your flavor profile. You like Akita, you like cleaner styles, or you like richer, deeper. Right. But there, nobody's come there yet and said, hey, this is the Grand Cru. Right? Mm. What I love though about sake, when I hear the stories from different like people that have like told me stories about sake, there's always a story about sake, a lot like wine, right? Mm -hmm. There's always okay, this is a sacred water source, and you know it was hand harvested in baskets by whoever hand harvested in a basket at that time, and it, it, it's amazing. There, there, there's, there is romance to it. There is Absolutely. there is a uh, there's a certain amount of prestige, I guess, that's going to uh -huh. be given to it, and I think that that is. That in itself. You can't buy 300 well, that, years yeah. of, of family practices. Yeah, and what about, yeah. the, what about the yeah, koji? Have 20, that, yeah. Oh, yeah, the I koji. Mean, that's proprietary for each kura, right? So. You can buy it these days. There's actually a, a government-owned yeast store, if you will, and you go and buy it. But whenever you can buy, find it Do you need coming, a special card and have to get onto a list to get it? You have to have back pain. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, a good. it's very Californian yeah. and Coloradian <laughs> and Colorado Washington. Washington. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but you're really lucky when a brewery can have their own natural occurring yeast, you know. Okay. As, as, and now it's funny. I was in Portland two days ago, hanging out with the Rogue guys, and they make the beard beer, and it, it's a great reference. They try to get uh, their own yeast from their farms, and they couldn't get any yeast out of it to produce the beer. And the <laughs> the winemaker John, uh, the brewmaster John, who's doing it for 25 years, he's got this long Fidel Castro beer. And they cut some, and as a joke, they send it over to the lab together with the other samples, all labeled, and they found yeast in his beard. So they make the beard beer, <laughs> and it is pretty delicious. <laughs> and that's where they got it. Wow. Rogue Brewery Rogue. in Oregon. Uh, yeah, pretty sure interesting. From his beard. If it's yeah. from his beard, I'll go try some. I, I hope yeah. so. He was telling the story with a straight face. So. <laughs> well, that's where it's they make the beer. Morimoto beer too, right? Yeah. yeah. Actually, uh, pretty fun on a side note, we went because we're making whiskey out of Chef's beer. Oh, wow. And uh, it, it was pretty, pretty really? fascinating. Yeah, adventure. you guys are just having a ton of fun over there. That's we cool. are. We're making we prosciutto and, and prosciutto, cool. and prosciutto yeah. beer, yeah. and sake, and push the envelope. Yeah, exactly. That's great. It's, it's fun, and it's fun to share with friends more than anything. Cheers on that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah cheers, story. guys. Yeah. It's been yeah. more than an honor yeah. and a pleasure, and I'm glad you guys stuck around. Yes. Thank you. Oh, Thank you very much treat. for Didier and Suzanne, and it's been a lot of fun. And uh, cheers, guys. Till next yeah. time. Parasake. Mm-hmm. <laughs>